Let's have a word of prayer and we will move forward. Kind Father, we thank you and we praise you for all things in Christ Jesus. We thank you for today and every blessing you've given us. We thank you for your love, grace, and mercy, the gift of faith, favor, and the forgiveness of our sins. You have been good to us all day long. You've protected us. You've stood by us. You've uh, led, you've guided, and you've directed our path. And we thank you for that. Thank you, God, for your goodness and your mercy towards us. You brought us to this point. And you brought us to this point for the purpose of sharing with you and with one another uh, through the study of your word and uh, through discussion of life's principles uh, that you have ordained for us to uh, walk in and walk after and that we might experience victory in our lives. Thank you now for this forum. Thank you for our presenter tonight. Thank you in advance for letting revelation knowledge flow, for sharing your heart and revealing your mind. And God, as always, any way you bless us, we will be satisfied. It is in the name of Jesus we pray and we boldly declare the devil is defeated. God, you are exalted. And Jesus, you are Lord. And all who believe the prayer of the man of God shouted hallelujah. Amen. And thank you, Jesus. Well, right where you are, give the Lord a hand clap of praise uh, in anticipation and excitement uh, for what I believe the Lord is going to share with us on tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God be the glory for the great things that he has done well, grace and peace be unto you from God, our Father, and Jesus Christ, our Lord. We honor and reverence each and every one of you in the name that matters most. That is the matchless and majestic name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. For it is, as the word of God declares, uh, it is the only name under heaven whereby men can be saved. And so we're so thankful uh, to be the recipients and beneficiaries of everything that comes in and with the name of Jesus. Again, thank those of you who are on tonight. Uh, thank you for your patience. If you came on and had to come uh, come back on as we were experiencing um, technical difficulties. And we want to thank Elder Bertha Colbert for her hard work and uh, her persistence in making sure that things uh, work out and work out well. And so those of you who are saying hello, hello back to you. I see uh, my niece, my niece daughter, Crystal Siobhan there. So uh, I'm going to speak to her lest uh, she had an attitude and I have to deal with that after the uh, session is over. I got to live with her, y'all don't have to. But we thank God for all of you who are on. And again, tonight, I am so excited. Very quickly, uh, my brothers and my sisters, I want to thank those of you who have participated in the ministry of giving. Uh, I am humble, TCI is humble. Um, our leadership and our membership, for those of you who um, are not members of TCI, though you are members of the TCI family, uh, those of you who um, may be um, in, uh, in other places across this country and across this world, your giving uh, has been so abundant and, uh, and we are so grateful, so thankful, so humbled by your sharing with us, uh, as well as uh, the best church anywhere, the side of heaven, Temple Church International. Thank you for your uh, cons consistent and uh, your persistent uh, giving of your tithes and in your offerings. And so, you know, we don't twist arms around here. We don't push, we don't prod. We, uh, we just simply uh, offer the opportunity uh, to give. And to that end, um, if you would like to give, if you would like to share a uh, seed, a generous seed into the ministry souls of TCI, you can give in a few ways. You can either go to our website and give online at tci-charlotte.com. Uh, click the donations tab, follow all the prompts, give when you're instructed to do so. Take your, your bank card, your debit card, your credit card. And uh, as the word of God declares, give as the Lord has prospered you and as you purpose in your heart to give. You can also uh, text to give uh, by texting the word give, G-I-V-E. That's give to 336-891-4023. You can uh, also, uh, cash app to give dollar sign church favor. And then you can call area code 704-507-2397, um, at any time, uh, that you are moved or prompted to give, uh, please, ma'am, please, sir, do so. And may the Lord God bless you real good. Well, let's get into our discussion tonight. For me, this is a long time coming. Uh, I am excited about, first of all, our COVID-19 conversation series. 
uh, it has been uh, a blessing to me, very informative, as I've been able to share uh, in dialogue and discussion uh, with some of the greatest minds that uh, I am uh, privileged to be connected to. Uh, and tonight is no different. Um, you often hear me uh, talk about uh, my, my friends, my closest friends, uh, Orlando Wilson and Derek Triplett, James Adams, John Guns. Uh, but I'm privileged tonight to have uh, one more friend of mine, so close, so dear to my heart. And um, we've been talking a while about having some sort of conversation on some forum, even before COVID-19, talked about being able to share and, uh, and just allowing people to eavesdrop on the conversations that we have. Um, one of the best things that Bishop Derek Triplett ever did uh, um, for me um, throughout the course of our 20 some odd year relationships is he introduced me to our uh, guest tonight. Um, she is a chaplain, she is a speaker, she is an author, she's a life coach, uh, she is the creator of Soul Wealth. I'm so glad to have her own. I met her before I met her. Bishop Triplett talked for years about uh, Dr. Vicki Johnson uh, as if I knew who she was uh, and I felt like I knew her before I met her. And when that fateful day came that we met, uh, we have been brothers and sisters ever since. You'll, you'll understand brother and sister in a minute. I'll let y'all in on it. Uh, but would you please, TCI, help me to welcome my friend, my sister, Dr. Vicki Johnson. Come on, let's give her a hand. Let me see some clapping hands, even in the comment session. Can Dr. I come on now? You can come on now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to follow instructions because I don't want to get in trouble with you or Elder Colbert, so... She cutting up already, y'all. Good evening, TCI family. Nice to see you. Nice to be seen by you. Happy to be here to have this conversation. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate that. And um, as I said earlier, this has been a long time coming. And yeah. um, we've talked about uh, being able to interact in this way. Um, and with all of the platforms, and we'll talk about those later. Uh, but with all of the platforms that you have, uh, the stuff you got on SoundCloud and YouTube and all of the many platforms you have, uh, it took for your brother to invite you on my little old platform. So <laughs> I appreciate you. And, uh, any way I, in any way I could make it happen. I chill. I wanted to make I'm it. I'm grateful. Thank you. Good. You good today? I am. I'm great. I'm blessed. Good, good. I want to thank you also for your for your patience, uh, for sharing with us. And I really want to jump right into um, our discussion tonight, as we are a few minutes behind. Let okay. let me let me say again, as I said earlier, that one of the greatest blessings um, that I could have ever uh, received uh, was an introduction to you. Uh, thank you have you. Been such a uh, a balancing presence for me such an encouragement and such an inspiration. And I wanna say that publicly. So many times uh, we give people their flowers privately or worse off, we give them their flowers when they can't smell it. Mm. But I, I wanted to say to you, thank you so much for being who you are. You're welcome. Uh, and sharing with me, your niece is watching. Uh, hey. She said that she was not going, <laughs> she's on a Facebook sabbatical, right? So she, <laughs> She don't even watch her daddy on Sunday mornings. But oh my goodness! Her, hey, uh, niece. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it, and uh, the sentiment is mutual. So, yeah, I appreciate you as well. Thank you. I, I wanted to I wanted to have you on because these times in which we we live are very trying times. Mm -hmm. um, Charles Dickens said in, in *A Tale of Two Cities*: "These are the times that try men's souls." Yeah. 
uh, that, that humans are literally being pushed uh, to the edge of their mental capacities and ability just to survive. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, through many of our conversations, and of course, uh, my being privy to uh, not only um, conversations with you, but the things that you post, the things that you share on social media, et cetera, and the lives that you've impacted, um, I thought that this would be a great time and great season uh, to have this conversation, in particular about uh, what you call soul wealth, which yes. I think is a very, very interesting concept, et cetera. Um, I introduced you briefly um, as a chaplain and an author and a mentor, and of course, the founder of creator of Soul Wealth. But uh, just for the sake of those who are on, can you please just give us a little more insight into who Dr. Vicki Johnson is? Sure. I'm a mom. I'm a sister. I'm a daughter. I'm an auntie. I'm sure some of my many nieces and nephews and I'm a god mom. I'm sure my god children are out there watching. I'm a mentor. I call myself the mentor's mentor because through my Soul Wealth tribe, I'm so blessed and honored to mentor other mentors. I lead other leaders. I support other women who support other women. And that model really is one that I have adopted and am modeling after my spiritual father, Archbishop Ralph Dennis with the support of my pastor, Bishop Gregory Dennis. And I wanna just give a shout out to them and the Kingdom Worship Center family in Towson, Maryland, where I have been now for over 20 years. I was the associate pastor of women there for 17 years. Previously worked at BET for almost 20 years and currently support the mayor here in the District of Columbia in her office of entertainment. That is what I do professionally and have been in the entertainment and music industry now for almost 40 years. Can you believe that? Yeah. Almost 40 years. And in 2014, when I was preparing for a TED Talk, I did my first TED Talk in December of 2014 on the power of sacred sisterhood. And in preparation for that, as I was writing, literally, I was writing when women connect, collaborate, and create community, the result is soul wealth. And almost instantly, I heard Third John 2, God desires that we prosper and be in health even as, even as those two words were so powerful, our soul prospers. And what that said to me, the illumination of that, that I had immediately was that my life can be no greater than the state of my emotions. So regardless of how much scripture we know, how much we can pray, how whatever our giftings are, however much money we make, it does not matter. If my soul, which is the seat of my emotions, is sick, then so is my life. My life will never manifest abundance beyond the state of health or lack thereof of my soul, which is the seat of my emotions. And that is where soul wealth came from. So for the last six years, I have with the direction and guidance and inspiration of Holy Spirit, just been evolving and creating and now know that soul wealth is for such a time as this. I released my 12th book back in August of 2019. Soul Wealth, Finding Vision, Compassion, Authenticity, Abundance, and Legacy in the Midst of Chaos. I have been writing that book for about four years. Had no idea COVID-19 would be at the height or at the beginning, let me back up, at the beginning of its impact on the world. Protests, police brutality, police reform, had no idea. However, because... I am blessed to operate in the prophetic and apostolic when it comes to the fivefold ascension gifts. I am Bishop Triplett. I have been saying to him for at least 10 years that something was coming. 
And we used to have those kind of conversations, the conversations that even you and I have and he and I still at times have. I just didn't know what it was. And I used to say to him this verbatim. I used to say, Derek, I am telling you something is coming that is going to make 9-11 look like a blink. And that is not to lessen the devastation caused by 9-11 because I was here in DC when, when that, that plane crashed into the Pentagon. So I was deeply impacted by that as well. But I just knew and prophetically and intuitively that something was coming. And so again, about four or five years ago, Guy had me start writing the book Soul Wealth. And so that book was released in August of 19, 2019. And it's out there now. I have a mentorship community where I mentor women. You know, I have my Soul Wealth radio show that you mentioned that's available on demand on all podcast platforms, still working a full-time job, traveling, speaking. I'm a chaplain <clears throat> and, you know, I'm blessed to be who I am in the earth for such a time as this. Like I, everything that happened in my life up to this moment, Bishop, I, I was prepared for where I am now. And I, I used to say to Archbishop Dennis all the time, I'm so grateful that God gave me difficult times early in my spiritual journey so that I could now be walking in a place of spiritual maturity to offer support, insight, wisdom, and guidance, the anointing of Issachar, which we both walk in where we have an understanding of the times that we live in to know what the people of God ought to do. People are looking for a voice. People are looking for direction. People are looking for courage and confidence and clarity about what to do next. And so here we are, here we find ourselves in this place. I played basketball for about 15 years. The WNBA did not exist when I came out of Howard University. I'm originally from South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, came up here on a basketball scholarship to the DC area and stayed. And here I am walking in purpose, walking in my assignment and God did it because I wanted to be a flight attendant. I want enough to do with ministry. <laughs> I wanted to be a flight attendant and live my life, but God through a series of experiences and circumstances just ordered my steps to be here. And there's no other place I would rather be than serving than supporting and offering spiritual guidance, particularly to women, but I, I also support men. So that, that's my life in a nutshell. Proud mom, daughter is 26. She'll be 27 this year. Like I said, I have over 20, 25 nieces and nephews. I stopped counting um, and many godchildren. So here we are and, and I am blessed even in the midst of chaos because I wanna say to those who are listening that peace is possible regardless of what's going on externally. Peace within is possible. And I'll even go a step further, Bishop, and say perpetual peace is possible where it never ends. Wow. Wow. I, listen, um, you fell short of being a flight attendant, but you're a pilot. Ha, how about that? <laughs> Literally. Yeah. You were leading so many people um, through difficult, difficult, mm -hmm. Um, turbulence in this season. And uh, I, I appreciate you for, for the impact that you've had on so many. You said something really interesting earlier um, that you were thankful that God literally allowed you to have tough times before now. Yes. There's, there's a text and uh, third John two, for, for those of you who are on, uh, um, I didn't read the text, but third John two, uh, was one of the scripture. Uh, the other is First Thessalonians five twenty three that the Lord would preserve you holy, uh, mind, body, and spirit. And of course, uh, there are other scriptures that we'll reference in a minute. But what I thought was really interesting was um, as you made your statement about being prepared through hardship to be able to help um, escort others through this <coughs> turbulence. Uh, there's a passage in in Genesis chapter 37, I think it's around verse 25. It talks about the fact that uh, when Joseph's brothers, they saw him coming, they colluded, they stripped him and they threw him uh, in a pit, in a pit, in a pit 
the text says specifically was dry and empty. Uh, no food, no water. That was uh, the language of a famine. And what God does is he takes some through personal famines so that they are able to, um, to gain and garner experience, knowledge, et cetera, that they're able to um, know how to navigate those, those dry and empty seasons mm -hmm. so that when the time comes for widespread famine, that those persons will be thoroughly equipped to walk in purpose and walk in destiny. Absolutely. Uh, at, at the risk of sounding, um, of sounding a little um, disrespectful, I'm glad you had your trouble when you had it. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> I am too. Like I would not trade nothing for my journey, right? Um, in addition, I'm a living kidney donor. 10 years ago, I gave a, a kidney to my cousin. And I bring that up here because <clears throat> that is one of, and these are the words of my surgeon, one of the most altruistic gifts that I could offer to someone that I did not just save my cousin's life, but I saved two people's lives because I gave my cousin one of my kidneys. Somebody else could get a kidney that came up on the national registry. I remember the night before my surgery down in Miami at Jackson Memorial Hospital, I stood in the window of my hotel room looking into nothing. It was pitch black because we were at the Marriott Key Biscayne. They had upgraded us when they found out why we were there, my cousin and I. They upgraded us to like these high, high floors where really there was nothing outside the window but the ocean. But I could not see anything but darkness because it was nighttime. And I remember standing in the window um, of the hotel looking out and I said these words. I said, God, you have been good to me. Life has not been easy, but I've had a good life. And if I go in here tomorrow and I go into this operating room and I wake up in heaven, I'm okay with that. Wow. Like I had peace. So I go the next day, <laughs> guy has jokes. I was the first one they called back <laughs> to get prepped for surgery. Like my mom wasn't there yet. I was like, God, you got jokes. Like, why do I have to be the first one? I know what I said last night, but give me a little time, right? So I go back, my family gets to come see me and have the surgery. And when I wake up and see the lights in the recovery room, I remember thinking and saying, wow, I'm still here. Wow. So I guess there's more. Yeah. You know what, God? I'm going to live every day from this moment forward like it is the bonus that it is. Because when they put me under with anesthesia, they stopped my breathing completely and had a respirator breathing for me so that there would be no stress on any of my organs as they remove my kidney. Dude, I died, okay? Yeah. They stopped my breathing. Yeah. So when God gave me breath again, every day is a bonus. And I live, I live that. I live with the intention to walk in the steps that God has ordered for me every day. And I wanna go to sleep every night smarter than I was when I woke up that morning. That's why I just so love talking to you and Bishop Triplett and other people in our circle because it, it, it provokes me to want to learn and to become more like Christ every day in the earth where I am living in the revelation that God is not just great in me, God is great through me and God is great as me in the earth. And that is what our pursuit should be as we are walking through not just COVID-19 and protest and all of these times, but we are literally here to be Christ in the earth. Yeah. There are people waiting on each of us 
to be Christ in their lives. And you know how God set it up? He set it up so uniquely that we can't even go to a church building right now. Like never before have people had to be provoked into understanding I am the church. Right. Yo, I thought it was a building. Right. I was like, okay, enough already. Right. Wow. Y'all thought a building was a church. You're the church. And so now what people are experiencing is the reality of their faith. Do I really believe God? Right. Or was I just pretending and having an emotional experience because I was around other people in a building? So we, we have to prove now to ourselves, what do you really believe? Okay, you believe that? Let's see. Right. Now be a demonstration of your faith, which is your words. Right. Wow. You've answered my first question, which was how you became interested in self-care. Uh, I believe that had I had a, a kidney extracted, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been uh, inspiration enough for me as well. Yeah. I did that. I did not know that story. I'm oh, all, wow. I never heard it from wow. Triplet or anyone else. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about soul wealth, you know, the concept and then the, the movement uh, coming into existence, how it all materialized, what, what inspired you to, uh, for the lack of a better word, organize and formulate a something of this magnitude? Right. So it started as an element in my TED Talk. And then after the TED Talk, I just sat with it for a while. But, so I have to go back in order to answer that question. So in 2000, in 2000, I started Girl Talk. But before I started Girl Talk, in, in 1999, 2000, I had a radio show here in the Washington, D.C. area every day, a feature called I'm Every Woman. And this, you have to understand, is pre-social media. This is pre-email accounts. This is pre everybody having a cell phone. This is when people really listen to the radio and, and gospel for the most part was on the AM band. It wasn't even on, we didn't have all the praise stations back then. So I was doing a daily feature called I'm Every Woman. And it was a one minute empowerment moment. And the revelation came to me um, and the idea for the empowerment moment came to me because Bishop Ralph Dennis, Archbishop Dennis had been teaching that our pattern should be the pattern of Christ. Jesus, when he walked the earth, he was the earthly manifestation of apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. And I just sitting, thinking, asking God questions like I do because I'm really curious all the time. Well, God, why is that? What is that about? And I started having this inner dialogue about, well, I should be like Christ then. I'm every woman. I'm a mother. I'm a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm a wife. You know, I'm an auntie. I'm a businesswoman. I'm all these things. I said, but you know what, Christ? Christ never tried to be all of the ascension gifts at the same time. Although he embodied each gift, he mm. only manifested the gift that was needed for the moment. And wow. the illumination came to me like maybe that is why some marriages are in trouble because women, although they embody multiple manifestations in their personhood, they're not discerning the need. Jesus discerned the need and that is the gift that he manifested. What do I mean? So when you come home to your family, if you run a business or you're an executive on your job, when you come home, you're not your husband's boss. You're not your children's boss. When you come home, you have to discern the need and then um, assume or man begin manifesting the role of wife and mom. When you go to work, you're a supervisor, you're a manager, you're an employee, or you're a business owner. You're not a mother, wow. right? So you shouldn't be talking to people at your job like they're your children. So it was that kind of thing. And so that's where I'm Every Woman came from. That turned into a quarterly event where I used to have about 
anywhere, a minimum of 300 to 1,000 women. And these women were listening to me every day on the radio. And I, I was on the radio. This is how God set me up. This is how God reintroduced me to the world because I was just coming from the backside of the mountain. I had, I had been recently divorced after being married for 14 years. And I have to reference that because when I was married, nobody knew my name really. They knew me as my ex-husband's wife because he was really well known, right? So I had to go through a, dis, a disintegration, if you will, a dismantling of my previous identity. And so this is where God, re, God was like, I'm going to reintroduce you. And so when he reintroduced me, I was on the radio every day. Every day at 730 when women were in their cars driving to work. To the point that when people would see me out, they would say, are you the I'm every woman lady? Yeah, that's me. I would do that moment every day, Monday through Friday, drive time for seven years. Wow. For seven years, God gave me that opportunity. And then out of that came Girl Talk, which was a quarterly um, gathering, a live gathering that was intimate, informal, and unscripted. And we used to talk about whatever. And that's when I started bringing Bishop Triplett to the DC area because every year I used to do one of those and dedicate it. Um, I used to have an all male panel with an all female audience. And the title was girl, you need to hear this. And I would just have all the men, all ages, all marital statuses talking to the women. And from girl talk in 2012, I did, I did a, I just wanted to have a big pajama party. Right. So I did, I, I, got this hotel, had this weekend retreat. And on the last day of the retreat, the women were like, and there's about 250 women who came to this event. They're like, so Vicky, what are we gonna do after this? I was like, I don't know. I just wanted to have, you know, a big pajama party. And these were women who were listening to me on the radio. Somebody said, you should start a Facebook group. Here we go. I was like, what's Facebook? <laughs> and so I started the Facebook group. <clears throat> And that group grew to over 5,000 women. Wow. I was like, yo, this is not what I'm, um, this is not it. So I did the group for about two years. Then I closed the group, started a community page. Then I did the TED Talk. And here is the evolution. And I want to just pause right here just to insert parenthetically that sometimes you are doing the right thing in the wrong place. Say it again. Sometimes you are doing the right thing in the wrong place. <clears throat> it is possible for your previous assignment to evolve into something else. This is why you have to be discerning. This is why you have to get quiet and spend time and attune your ear, your spiritual ear to God's mouth so you can hear his direction in a whisper. God has been whispering to us for a long time and we haven't heard the whisper. So God is like, okay, earth is about to scream. And God, earth is screaming right now, right? So people are still, people are quiet, people are listening. And so I evolved Girl Talk Unplugged into soul wealth, sacred sisterhood. And then it just kept, evolving, just kept growing, kept growing. And I wanna encourage somebody right here because I've been doing this a long time. I got ordained in 1999, Bishop, 1999, okay? Wow. I've been doing this pre-social media. I built the following that God has blessed me to influence. I built that with no social media. So it was frustrating for me to come into this new season, I'll say within the last eight to 10 years, feeling like I had to start over. And God allowed me to be frustrated until I started living Job 22, which says agree with God quickly so you can have peace and good will come to you. God had to take me through that season of frustration so that I would surrender what I thought my life was supposed to look like. And then I started hearing, can you hear me now? You good now? 
-hmm. Okay, this is what we're doing. This is how we're moving. This is what's going on. And so there was a season in my life where I felt God had forgotten about me. Really was. And I distinctly remember being in somebody else's service, another mutual friend of ours, Dr. Ann Mercer. I was at her conference down in Jacksonville, Florida, and another woman of God was preaching. She said, Vicki, come here. God has something for me to say to you. And she whispered in my ear, God said, he's not done with you. There's more. Wow. What did I do? Your girl fell on the floor and started crying because... I was like, ah, thank you. Right. Now I know I was being preserved. So God hasn't forgotten you, whoever I'm talking to. You have not been forgotten. You have not been rejected. You have been preserved for such a time as this. Because when God does it, all you have to do is agree with God quickly, walk into it. Agree with God quickly. You're going to have peace. That's how you know it's God. You'll have peace and good will come to you. So if you're frustrated, frustration is evidence that you haven't agreed with God. Wow. Y'all do me a favor. <laughs> like and then share, invite people even now. This is good. This is wow. Um, I want to... I want to kind of transition because okay. as you talked about your season of having or feeling like God had forgotten you, mm -hmm. that is, that's probably, if not the most lonely place mm. um, in the world. You can't, you can't describe it you can only say that you were there. My goodness, I'm trying to tell you. You can't. I'm trying to tell you. You can't give people the details. You can't, you know, you, you used a, one of my favorite analogies. Uh, you were on the backside of the mountain and you came back from the backside of the mountain. Um, and I've often said this in, in, in multiple discussions and perhaps you and I have even had this discussion. When we use that phrase, uh, people, there are people coming from the backside of the mountain who will be doing whatever they'll do in a particular season. Those aren't new people. No. Those are people who were great in one season, successful in one season. And then for whatever reason, that season ended. Sometimes it ended because of shame. Sometimes it ended because of scandal. Sometimes it ended because uh, of loss uh, in some way, shape or form. It, you know, it, it's, it's Moses after having spent 40 years um, in prominence in Egypt and then having to spend 40 years on the backside of a, de of a desert keeping sheep, stepping in a sheep's mess, uh, a prince serving though uh, as an under shepherd. Uh, yeah. And it was a lonely time. And it was not until Moses was on the backside of the mountain that he developed relationships. Uh, he developed a relationship, first of all, uh, with the daughter of Jethro, the Midianite. Uh, and of course, because he wanted her hand in marriage, he had to meet him. Mm -hmm. And he met a mentor. He, he met a life partner. He met a mentor all in that season of <laughs> stripping. That's it, that season uh, where he was on the back side of the bar. Wait, can I say something? Like yes, I'm about to burst, like my head is about to burst open, okay? Yeah. So when I met Archbishop Ralph Dennis, I was so frustrated with church, I was done. I was so frustrated. I wasn't done with God, I was done with church. I was so frustrated because what people were saying and teaching and demonstrating in church in my experience this is my experience was incongruent with what I was hearing God say with what I was reading in scripture and it seemed seemed as if people 
were leaving me behind when I knew, I'm going to just say it, like they were raggedy. Yeah. I was like, God, how are you blessing them and leaving me in the fire? And God said to me, it had to happen. Yeah. Philippians, these things had to happen so that when you come through, after you have suffered a while, right? I'm going to not only strengthen you, establish you, perfect you and, and, and settle you, but you will owe no one. I'm allowing people to turn a deaf ear to you. I'm not allowing people to take your calls. I'm not allowing people to respond to you because when, not if, when I bring you through this wilderness, Vicky, you will owe no man. Yeah. All you'll have to do is give me glory. Wow. And what God also said is the higher we ascend, seated with him in heavenly places, Ephesians chapter one, when we are seated with him in heavenly places and all things are under our feet, the higher you go, the higher you ascend, the less you need. So you really get to this place where less is more and where you live a life unattached to the outcome where you truly go through every day. God, I don't know, but I trust you. Wow. That peace that surpasses all understanding, it really does guard your heart. It really does guard your mind. It really does give you insight to stop wasting heartbeats on things that in five minutes won't matter because you can't get those heartbeats back. So you have to, you, I, I encourage people to start living. Ask yourself this question. Is this, is this argument worth my heartbeat? Because when you exhaust your heartbeats, that's when you're going to die of natural causes, barring any other unforeseen or uncommon occurrence you die when you exhaust the number of heartbeats that you came here with so when you understand that you only have a certain number of heartbeats you start living your life really on purpose really intentionally like do I really want to go through this anymore do I want to submit myself or subject myself to this no 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 because I'm I'm using up heartbeats that I cannot recoup so when wow. you start living intentionally like that and on purpose and on your assignment, God has obligated himself that he cannot deny himself when we start living in the fullness of him found in Ephesians 3 and 20. When we're living in the height, depth, width and breadth of God, when we are so filled up with him that as we move. Bishop, people cannot tell where he ends and I begin and vice versa. So wherever I am, he is working in me to will and to do his good pleasure, yeah. exceeding abundantly every desire that I have according to the power that's working in me. So when I decrease and allow God through Jesus Christ to fully overtake me and I'm living an overflow, he has to exceed himself. That's what soul wealth is. Soul wealth is when God exceeds himself in your life that he blows your mind every day, that he leaves you speechless. And when people are asking you, how did that happen? Where did that favor come from? All you can do is God did it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's it. Wow. And I have peace and I have preserved my heartbeats and I go to sleep at night. Since God neither slumbers nor sleep, I figured it's no need in both of us staying up all night. So going to sleep for me is a ritual. I get my lavender essential oils. I put in my aromatherapy. You know, I drink my chamomile tea or my sleepy time tea. Like I have no, people are amazed at how quickly I fall asleep. Like I'm going to bed, I'm out. I can get right in bed and go to sleep yeah. because I am sleeping. I have sweet sleep in the Lord Jesus Christ every night. But that came from enduring the fire. Yeah. until I could enjoy the blessings of the Lord that, that make us rich and have no sorrow attached to it. Enduring the fire, ah. enduring it. Like what, what's, in, what's interesting is one of the things I've always said is one of the worst things you can do is to exit a storm or a fire prematurely. 
Oh, you better listen. <laughs> and, and you have that option in terms of taking things into your own hands, mm -hmm. um, trying to escape, trying to um, avoid certain things that come with the process of preparation. Um, my mind goes back to the story of the Hebrew boys and they're, in, they're thrown in the furnace. King has them to open the furnace, check on them. The Bible says, somebody said that, uh, well, we put three in, but now we see four. And the fourth one looks like the son of God. <laughs> that there was someone in the fire already. And when they, when they were thrown into the fire and I'm just taking license now, there was relationship formed in that particular place. And so as you talked about um, Apostle or Archbishop Dennis literally um, being there for you in that season where you felt like uh, God had forgotten you, but really God had you on his mind. He's, he was transitioning you to your next. Can you talk to us a little about why healthy relationships are essential in, in this season in particular? Because as you said, there were people who were falling off, mm -hmm. right? You didn't understand why. Um, and so God literally brought some relationship to an end and, and in that season birthed others. And I think we need to understand that a part of soul, you know, the Bible says uh, that uh, iron sharpens iron and, yeah. and, and we need those relationships that sharpen us. And, and this is going to kind of, kind of lead to uh, my next question, so I don't want to go too far okay. into this, but um, if relationships aren't sharpening you, then relationships aren't essential because if they're not making you sharp, they're making you dull. Right. So can you talk to me, talk to us about how essential it is in this, in this season of reset in this season of, um, of re reimagining mm -hmm. ourselves, reimagining our lives, how important is relationship? Everything God did is rooted in relationship. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that is our model, a healthy relationship will cause you to give and receive. There's reciprocity in healthy relationships. Relationships are important because God works in our lives through the vehicle of relationship. When you have favor, when you have connection and covenant with people, you don't need money, for example. Money is good. Money answers all things. Let's not get it twisted. I like money. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Money answers all things. But if I have a covenant relationship with someone and they have a yacht, I don't need one. If I have a covenant relationship with someone and they have a private jet, I don't need a private jet. Uh, I, I, you know, I pledged Delta Sigma Theta sorority when I was in college. And you know, every time one of my line sisters has an accomplishment, you know, it's like, oh, we did this. Like one of my line sisters just bought a beach house. Uh, and we're like, oh, what? the orcs got a beach house. <laughs> that is the power of relationship. And that is the power of abundance. Um, a lot of times we're exhausted. We are tired. We are, hmm emotionally drained because we're carrying the toxicity of dull relationships wow. and we already know it we know it as soon as we get around certain people we're like oh god 
right? Yeah. Listen to your body. Like self-care is not just getting your nails done, getting a massage, getting rest, eating healthy, drinking water, staying hydrated, taking your supplements and exercising. Self-care is also eliminating people from your life that are draining literally your life force. Wow. And some of these people you love. Yeah. So you have to practice loving people from a distance. Wow. Because people will take from you. People will gladly accept whatever you have to offer, leaving you with nothing. They'll say thank you and go on about their business. Yep. So my provocation, if, if this is resonating with you, is to eliminate people from your life who no longer serve where you are or where you are going. There are some relationships in some of your lives that are anchoring you in a place that God told you to leave. But because you don't want to leave people and they don't want to move for a myriad of reasons, but you don't want to leave them. Like that's not on God. That's on you. Wow. To release relationships that are dull, that are not sharpening. And you know it. Like you know it. We're talking about self-care. Trust the divinity that is within. Trust the voice of God within. You know it. When you get around certain people, you get a headache. Your stomach starts hurting. You lose your appetite. You can't sleep at night. And we're concerned about people. We're staying up all night can't sleep, worry about people who could care less about the impact of their behavior on your well-being, on your being well. And you know what? You're staying up all night and they're asleep. Yep. So sometimes you have to exercise tough love with people and not interrupt their consequences because we learn the lesson revelation is birthed through experience. Like wow. people say, Vicki, how did you learn this? Suffering, walking in the fire, sitting in the fire, being alone, feeling lonely, getting my feelings hurt, feeling left out, being extremely misunderstood all my life. I'm good with it now because my weirdness is my superpower. The things that make me weird make me powerful. Right. And that's what I want to say to the other weird people out there. Like the things that make you a misfit are the things that God is going to use to impact the world. So keep trusting God. Like relationships are critical. I'm telling you, they're critical. And some relationships, the season has ended. Some relationships came just for a reason. Some relationships were in your life for a season. And then there are a few quality, very divinely sent relationships that are for a lifetime, are for a lifetime. And you have to be able to discern that so that you can with clarity, confidence, and courage, walk out your assignment while you're here in the earth. That's about relationship. I just heard as you were speaking, that right relationship requires reciprocity. Mm -hmm. You better know it. And I think one of the problems, and somebody needs to put that in the comment, right relationship requires reciprocity. I think one of the problems we have um, is the fact that we accept less we consistently accept less than we consistently give. And as we continue to accept less consistently than we give consistently, we're always operating at a deficit. And what winds up happening is the ones who are the predominant um, beneficiaries will become comfortable with not reciprocating. 
<laughs> and we create an environment of comfortability not knowing that it's our responsibility to challenge what needs to be changed. Yep. Because if, if we won't confront it, it won't change. Right. And it creates an environment of imbalance. And if you're in a relationship like this, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm bent over, right? If you're yeah. in a relationship like this, at some point, your body adjusts to the environment. And now you're walking bent over yeah. metaphorically in your relationships. And you are the one overcompensating because the imbalance is in your life and the person receiving the benefit of your leaning toward them is just, just as happy as mm -hmm. can be. And I want to say that's not love. It's not self-loving. Neither is it loving toward them. It's codependency. Okay. It is your needing to be needed. And it is them, you know, needing, needing you to need to help them. And that is a tragedy in the life of a lot of believers. I wonder how many people, and this is a good place. Wow, will you come back and do a part two at some point? I'd love to. I mean, maybe even tomorrow night because people are asking for it. Now, I don't know. What Let's do it. But tomorrow night at 7.30, yeah. we're going to do everything squared away. I want you to pray. And I want to tell you what. First of all, I saw a young man, Brother Vashon. We are praying for your friend and your friend's family. Uh, we're, we're standing in agreeing with you. Uh, concerning healing, deliverance, or whatever needs uh, to take place in that situation and circumstance. And may the Lord bless you for uh, carrying the burden of your loved one uh, and, and asking for prayer and intercession. I wonder, sis, how many people who are watching us now, who've joined us now, are dealing with the scenario that you just painted and watch this. And they are the one person that many people are attached to and bringing them out of balance. Mm. I wonder um, how many people are, care are not in mutually beneficial reciprocative relationships they have, they have romantic partners who are not reciprocating the way they should. They have platonic relationships, friends. They have family members. And all of this stuff is draining them. And I want you to pray after, 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 after I drop this on us. Jesus and... Um, and, and, and the 11 around the table. And he says something that's really interesting. He says, Simon, Satan has asked for you and he desires to sift you with wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith does not fail. And when you are converted, when you have returned to me, and that old, we don't even understand what that whole return to me, when you have become the rock, when you have become the mirror image of who I am, then you can strengthen your brothers. But Jesus says that because he's just told them that he's about to meet his fateful date at Calvary. And Peter jumps in and says, Lord, no, that ain't gonna happen to you. I'll stop this. And I think sometimes, and somebody needs to hear us, and I, here's why I want you to pray. I want you to pray, number one, because the oil is on you. But then number two, I want you to pray because I know that there's multiple people on here who are in this situation. The revelation is this, that sometimes the devil destroys you through good intentions. 
Like you carrying everybody. You always, you're, you're inviting, you embrace people. You even give them the opportunity to come and go as they please. And my last question, and we'll pick up with this tomorrow night at 7.30, because I was gonna ask you about how to identify toxic relationships. We're gonna talk about it tomorrow night. Okay. And the fact of the matter is, you are so out of balance and so out of whack that the toxicity of the relationship or the relationships leave you totally depleted and you're never able to optimize the greatness of who you are. And the problem is this, there are some windows that when they close- They'll they never open again. There's some opportunities when they pass that they'll never come back around again. Especially those of you who are in your latter years. And what Dr. Vicki has said to us is so powerful, so profound, and listen, so purpose-filled for this night that you literally have to examine the relationship that you're in now. Don't let people kill you who will outlive you. <laughs> they kill you, they'll live, Either they'll find somebody else to kill or they'll, 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 they'll get it right. And you can't let that be your story. Listen, thank you so much, sis. Thank you for consenting to join us tonight, tomorrow night. Uh, I don't even know what I, I'm- This I'm, is my heart. This is my heart, right? Like I live for this. This is why, this is why I have agreed with God. I live for moments like this and in, in, in the, light and love of Archbishop Ralph Dennis and my bishop, my pastor, Bishop Gregory Dennis, you know, they model this. I live spirit, soul, and body, my life for God's glory. And the ultimate goal is transformation. It's transformation. You know, it is for us to become more like Christ on a daily basis. And the atmosphere is ripe for that alchemy of our souls. The, the atmosphere is ripe because we cannot give away what we don't have. And when we constantly give from an empty cup, it not only leads to a deficit, but it leads, leads to a life of bitterness, resentment, and dis Ease. And we can talk about that more tomorrow. Disease, I don't care what disease it is, cancer, chronic situations in our bodies, high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, all of the, the, the morbidities that have contributed to the mass, the massive dying of Black people due to COVID-19 is because collectively we as a people have begun to live with stress and call it normal. Normal. And it's not. So the energy and the emotions and the anger and the trauma that we are repeatedly subjected to, whether it's in our lives, whether we know someone, whether we love someone, whether we see it on TV, whether we see it on social media, we are repeatedly bombarded with trauma we as black people are living with PTSD. And then we try to pray it away. We try to speak in tongues it away. We try to preach it away. You know, we, we try to quote scripture to get it to go away. And it's not going to do that until we hit a hard stop and begin to breathe again because we've been holding our breath collectively. And coronavirus spiritually, the spiritual implication of any respiratory issue is lack of oxygen. That's why people have been put on respirators and CPAP machines. And, you know, this coronavirus is attacking our ability to breathe. And so we have to get our breath back. We have to oxygenate our lives again by making room 
for the wind of God to come through, to give us fresh air so that we can breathe, be revitalized, to go out and be Christ in the earth with the anointing of Issachar, having an understanding of the time so that we know what the people of God ought to do. So I live for this. Thank you for sharing your platform, for inviting me to come to be able to impart. I pray that those who are listening have been blessed. And shall I pray right now? Please do. That's why you my sister. All right, brother. <laughs> so Father, we thank you for this is the day that you have made. We choose to rejoice and give your name glory in spite of what is going on in the world, in spite of what is going on in our communities, in spite of what is going on in our families, in spite of what is going on in our minds, in our bodies. We rejoice and we give your name glory. We thank you. We thank you because our steps are ordered by you, that no good thing will you withhold from us as we continue to walk upright before you. Father, I pray for every man, woman, every young woman, every young man who is listening to this conversation, God. It's no accident. There are no accidents in you. I thank you for every person whose steps you have directed to this conversation. I pray that something that has been said tonight speaks to their heart, pricks their hearts, pricks their minds, convicts them to change, to make different choices, to walk in courage, to walk in clarity, to walk in confidence, because you said in your word in Philippians 1 and 6, that we can be confident of this very thing, that because you've begun a good work in us, you are able to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for my brother, Bishop Long, and for the TCI family. I thank you that although there are many members, we are one body. I thank you that your voice is reverberating in the earth, that you are releasing revelation, that you have released illumination. And from that will first come personal revolution in our lives so that we can then begin to evolve and ascend to this place that you have ordained for us to be seated, to stay seated at your right hand and to keep all things under our feet. Thank you, God, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, that every tongue that rises in judgment, you, the Lord, shall condemn. For this is the inheritance of the servants of the Lord. We lift up now every family that is burdened, every family that is grieving, every family that is perplexed, every family that is in turmoil. We collectively now on their behalf stand in the gap and we cast our care upon you for you care for us. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Thank you for your grace that is sufficient, for your mercy that is new every day, for favor that surrounds us on every hand. You said in Psalm 41 and 11, by this we shall know that you favor us because you will not allow our enemies to triumph over us. Not the enemy of COVID-19, not the enemy of debt, not the enemy of confusion, not the enemy of chaos, not the enemy of police brutality, not the enemy of white supremacy and inequality, not the enemy of ignorance and lethargy, not the enemy of laziness, not the enemy of giving up. But God, we thank you that in you we live, move, and have our being. That in you, we find hope, 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 because hope deferred makes the heart sick. So God, we thank you in this moment. We thank you that you're able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of your glory with exceeding joy to the all wise God, be glory and majesty, dominion and power in every area of our lives. I decree it now. In the name of Jesus, it shall be established that what you have done in this conversation is now and forever, that our lives will never be lower than they are in this moment, that all we will do from this point forward is ascend and stay seated in heavenly places with all things under our feet. We give you glory for all of this. I pray tonight that we have sweet sleep. I pray tonight 
that we go to bed confident in you, that you will bring us through this because all things work together for our good and for your glory, because we're called according to your purpose and we give you glory for it in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Love you. I love you too, brother. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow <laughs> night with bells on 730. We're going to have all the kinks worked out. I promise you. Awesome. I look forward to it. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. And everyone else have a great night. Thank you for joining us. Join us again tomorrow night, 730. This same forum. Uh, we're going to get started on time. Come in early as early as 725 if you if you will, because I have a feeling that part two is going to take us to a whole nother dimension. And Bishop, can I just also invite people to, to connect with me? Um, sure. All things Vicky on all platforms, all things V-I-K-K-I here on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and on YouTube. I am all things Vicki Johnson. I would love to stay connected um, so that we can strengthen each other as we move forward into the best days of our life. Wonderful. And if you will please remind us again tomorrow night. Sure. Uh, very same thing. Y'all have been blessed. I'm sure you have. Good night. Love you Good all. Good night. Peace. Yeah. Well, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we're so thankful today for all things. We thank you for all of your love, your grace, and your mercy, for the gift of faith, favor, and the gift of forgiveness of our sins. We thank you today for all that you've been to us over the course of today, how you've protected us from danger seen and unseen, how you've walked with us, how you've uh, never left us, neither forsaken us, how you've uh, spoken to us all day long. We've been in communion with you, Father, hearing promptings from you. And so we want to thank you so much for just being a very present help, a God who is with us. We honor you for that. Thank you for this time and space in which we share uh, in this forum as uh, we are poised and ready, waiting to hear from you further insight, further uh, instruction, further direction uh, as it relates to becoming whole, well, and healthy. We thank you tonight for uh, our guests, for our presenter, Dr. Vicki Johnson. Father, we uh, thank you for what you did last night, said last night through her, and we are waiting with bated breath uh, to hear the further furtherance of what you've given her and even the conclusion of the matter. For everyone who's on this call, this line, we want to thank you for them as well. And uh, we pray, God, that tonight revelation knowledge would flow, that you would share your heart, reveal your mind in any way you bless us. We'll be satisfied. Anoint us with ears to hear, hearts to receive, minds to understand, and a will to apply what your word instructs. It is in Jesus' name we pray, and we boldly declare the devil is defeated. God, you are exalted, and Jesus, you are Lord. And all who agree with the prayer of the man of God, shout it hallelujah. Amen. And thank you, Jesus. My big cousin, uh, sister cousin Tammy White is on. And so, Tammy, so glad to see you as well. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise uh, in anticipation for what we're about to experience tonight. That's right. Right there in the uh, in the uh, comment section, let me see somebody with raised hands, clapping hands, giving God praise just for life, first of all. And then secondly, giving God praise for uh, what we're about to experience tonight. Well, let's go ahead and get to it. Tonight, I am honored and I'm thankful. I'm grateful uh, for uh, my friend, my sister, Dr. Uh, Dr. Vicki Johnson. I was thinking the other day that I probably need to give you all a disclaimer uh, that not every brilliant uh, uh, and uh, expert female that I know is named Vicky. Uh, I thought about the fact that first we had, uh, we had uh, assistant chief of police, Vicki Foster. Then we had um, uh, Vicki Morganson from Brisbane, Australia. And now tonight we have again, Dr. Vicki Johnson. Um, so I promise you that uh, I have others whose names aren't Vicky, who are as well. To that end though, uh, I wanna bring on my friend. And, and I said last night, uh, you know, you 
you hear me talk a lot about in TCI, you know, you know who my guys are, you know, uh, Bishop Derek Triplett, Bishop Orlando Wilson, Bishop James Adams, Bishop John Guns, you know who my guys are. Uh, but uh, uh, Dr. Vicki Johnson is my girl. She's one of my uh, best of my best friends, and I'm so thankful to have her on. Uh, Dr. Vicki, will you please come on and say hello to the people? Hello, people. <laughs> because? What's in the name? What's in the name? <laughs> So good to see you. So good to see you. Good to see you as well. How's your day been? Amazing. I'm sure. As always. always. Every day is amazing. It's good. It's good. Even when it doesn't feel good, it's good. All things work together for our good. That's right. So I I appreciate you. Um, I I just want to say to you, as I said earlier uh, in our earlier conversation, you uh, literally blessed us tremendously and so many uh, comments and compliments uh, and rave reviews uh, have uh, been given to me, shared with me about how impactful last night's gathering was. I'm and- grateful for that. You know, it's, it's, it's all God is what I want to say, not me. Um, learned some years ago that my life really is for God's glory and I've accepted that. I have agreed with God quickly so that I can have peace perpetually and good can come to me. I don't have to chase good. Good looks for me because I've agreed with God. And my intention every day is to be in alignment with God's purpose for me and for the people that he has assigned me to reach and impact. So I'm really grateful for that. And this is what I live for. I share it with you. This gives me life knowing that I am able to support others as they tap into and activate their God power and pay it forward because that's what it's about. I, I never want to lead people to me. I want to always point people to God. And so it is an honor to you know, be an available vessel to do that and to be connected with friends and brothers like you and Bishop Triplett and others, you know, who create this sacred warrior circle to impact the world for the kingdom. So let's do it. Let's do it. I want to pick up where we left off last night. Our um, our conversation um, kind of merged into uh, the the necessity of having um, having good and healthy and strong relationships in this season, um, and we talked a little about how in your season of transition from where you were to where you are and where you are going, God used uh, use um, a few people, but most certainly uh, Archbishop Ralph Dennis to, to speak and to speak life yeah. uh, into you and how we talked about how lonely that season can be, that season of transition of uh, that season of, I call it recalibration. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, 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 and sometimes when you're on the backside of, of the desert, if you will, um, you're lonely, you're isolated, and God sends people. And it's so important to nurture those relationships um, because those are the relationships that will prepare you yeah. for, where you're, for where you're on your way to. Then we moved into the fact that not only are uh, healthy relationships necessary, uh, but that it is also necessary for unhealthy relationships to come to an end. And I was watching the watching uh, our, our exchange yesterday, and you said something that was so powerful that you know, you know when it's time. You know what you're supposed to let go. Um, you know that you're supposed to let it go. Um, but in many instances, many of us don't. And we talked last night about how those relationships can bring us out of balance. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I think a, a necessary component 
of self-care is self-preservation, <laughs> right? That, that um, we are stewards uh, of not just the gift that God has given us, we are stewards of the gift that we are. Right. And uh, oftentimes we find ourselves um, being drained, being, being pulled out of alignment, out of balance uh, because of um, wrong relationships. You know, we said right relationships require reciprocation. Yes. And one of the marks of a wrong relationship is when there is no mutuality uh, in terms of reciprocation. So I want to pick up now um, where I left off because our, our next question is, uh, how do we identify toxic relationships? Well, the first thing that I want to say when we talk about relationships that are no longer in alignment with who we are and what we're doing is that as much as we can to release people in love. I'm not saying you have to be all touchy-feely and things like that, but be mature about it. Bless people and release them because the energy that you put out is already on its way back to you. So this is a characteristic of spiritual maturity, emotional maturity. It doesn't have to be ugly. It doesn't have to be nasty. It's not necessarily going to be easy, but in the long run, that releasing and love with a blessing is going to come back to you when you least expect it and when you need it most. How do you recognize toxicity in relationships? The first thing is that you're going to feel it in your body somewhere, stomach ache, headache, uh, energetic resistance that turns into anxiety, not being able to sleep, always feeling like you're giving more than you are receiving. And sometimes that's not a feeling, it's literal. Like you can see it. Why are you the one always calling? Why are you the one always giving? Why are you always the one showing up? Yet when it's time for you to be supported, crickets no phone call, no presence. And divine relationships have the ministry of presence with them. What do I mean? I mean that divine relationships show up anyway. They don't have to be invited. They don't have to be asked. And when they show up, they don't even have to be recognized. But having their presence in your presence is the gift. And so some people, you know, scripture says in Proverbs, a friend loveth at all times and a brother or a sister is born for times of adversity. That was one of the first scriptures that God illuminated to me over 20 years ago when it comes to relationships. There are some people, and I know I am this person in the lives of some people. I was born to show up for certain people in my life only in crisis because I have the gift of being an anchor when people are in crisis. And we don't talk every day. We don't spend time together. We don't go on vacations together. You know, I don't share good news, not so good news with them necessarily, but there are times when I show up because they need me and we have established covenant and our relationship, it's just like a marriage. Friendship is the same. Communication is critical, right? What are we agreeing to do? Who are we agreeing to be to each other? So when the agreement is broken, that is the time to address it, communicate or not. Sometimes you just have to wait and see. Every, every breach or mark of a pivot doesn't necessarily have to be addressed verbally. Sometimes you have to watch people's patterns because patterns don't lie and neither does energy. Energy doesn't lie. That's why I said you have to listen to your body because you'll get this hit 
I'll call I call it a spiritual hit. You'd be like, mm, that didn't feel good. Okay. Let me just check myself. Sometimes you also need to have a, a, a multitude of counsel where scripture says in the multitude of counsel, there's safety. So there are some people, Bishop, that I have in my life that I can check myself with. Listen, this happened in this scenario. This is the context. And I just want to make sure I'm not being sensitive or in my ego. Like if I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. So I check myself before I address situations. I am so intentional about my relationships. I know where everybody fits. And early on um, in my own life, I learned that people fit into four categories. They were either a mentor, somebody that I could learn from. They were a protege, somebody I was assigned to teach and pour into. They if they were not a mentor or a protege, they were someone who was going to stand shoulder to shoulder with me and we were going to walk out our assignments together, supporting one another, undergirding one another. And if they were not a mentor, a protege, or somebody standing shoulder to shoulder with me, they were an enemy to my purpose. And therefore I had to keep them at a certain distance from me. So I like to use the house. Some people, they pull up, I'm like, just blow when you're outside. Call me when you're pulling up. Some people, I'm like, when you come, you know, just knock on the door, I'll let you in, right? Some people get to come and sit down in my living room. Some people get to sit in my kitchen and have a meal. And then very few people get to come in my bedroom and even fewer people get to go in my closet, right? That's how you can measure who has access because the deeper you allow someone in, the more information they get, the more intimate the relationship becomes. So what is important here to say is people have to earn the right to go deeper in your life. Stop giving away so much so soon. Wow. Somebody, I don't, why we're having this feedback. Someone please put those four categories of uh, relationships in the in the comments. Yeah, so it's mentor, mm -hmm. protege, my equal, or my comrade, or they're an enemy to my purpose. And let me say right here, all of your enemies don't hate you. <laughs> Some of your enemies love you. It's it's not mixed with malice. It's mixed with being out of alignment. So if it's not feeding me, if it's not fueling me, if it's not adding to me, if it's not multiplying me, then it's toxic. If it's taking away from me, if it's dividing me, dividing my loyalty, dividing my energy, dividing my love, dividing my attention, like my attention is an investment. If I give you some of my time, that's an investment. And I am worthy of a return. You are worthy of a return. So relationships that are toxic, here is really simply put. They're dividing and they're subtracting. Wow. That's wow. it real clear, like really simple. If they're not adding to you, if they're not multiplying, if they're not investing in you, What's the purpose? Mm -hmm. What's the purpose? Every relationship should have a purpose. I want to go back and unpack. Um, first thing is really interesting. We we did um, I did this singles virtual singles piece for a, a friend of mine who passed us here in the area, uh, and TCI has heard this over and over again. Um, the the narrative of the prodigal son is really interesting. Because the prodigal son goes into a far country, spends everything he has, and when the famine comes, he joins up with a swine farmer. The Bible says it gets so bad that he can't, you know, he would even reduce himself to eating the slop of, of the hogs, 
not just being in the PP, which, which was of course totally against Jewish uh, law and custom and culture, but he was going to eat what they ate. Mm. And the Bible says, but then he came to himself. He realized who he was and where he came from. Uh, I'll arise and go home to my father and I'll say all that I'm gonna say to him. And, and I brought up the point that this boy did not give a two weeks notice. He did not go back and say, thank you for the opportunity uh, to work during the time of the famine. He made up his mind and he went. And I thought I heard, <laughs> and sometimes quick and clean breaks are the best remedy, right? And you talked about, you talked about this yesterday and, and earlier today, you, you talked about the fact, or today in our presentation, you talked about the fact that, you know, sometimes you address it, sometimes you don't say anything, you just kind of watch. And um, I'm wondering if in fact, when relationships are toxic, um, if in fact that is, um, because many people have, have guilt with, with just moving on, right? Mm -hmm. many, many people have, they feel guilty because sometimes closure is not closure. Sometimes closure is come closer and let me, let me give you my explanation. You give me your explanation and let's see if we can continue this toxic relationship that, uh, that serves no purpose. That, that's the one thing. I'm saying second thing, and, and, and I want to get out of your way. So I was, I was driving one night, I was preaching for my uncle, uh, north, in, uh, north of me in North Carolina. And I was on my way home and my grandfather appears to me and he says something to me that I didn't understand until later. He said, Kevin, be friendly to all, be a friend to some and be friend few. And that kind of, that kind of threw me out of whack for a minute, but then I prayed and the Holy Spirit said to me, understand that relationships are spatial. There's some people that'll be in your life that you know beyond the shadow of a doubt, you're their friends, but they're not yours. Right. Those are the people that you're there for in crisis, those are the people who you say blow the horn and I'll come out and I'll holler at you uh, and we'll do what we got to do. Then there are some people that you are, that you befriend or that you, or that you are friends with, but you keep your tolerances high and your expectations low. It's like you understand your role, your position in their lives and, and you don't put any, you don't put any, um, any weight on their responsibility to be as you are. But then there are some people, and I would say those are the people who, who you allow into the living room, around the kitchen table, et cetera. But the people you allow in the bedroom, it's that third group, those are the people that you have a mutual expectation of reciprocation from. Those are the people that you befriend. Those are the people that you allow into those intimate spaces. And I think one of the things uh, that I've learned, now you said this earlier, but I just want to kind of reiterate it. Uh, one of the things that I've learned is there is a tendency for some who are, who have especially this Messiah complex, but I'll let you deal with that later, who have a tendency to pull the wrong people into the wrong spaces. Mm and stay too long in those situations and become out of balance, out of alignment. Uh, and I, you, made a very, you made a very powerful point when you say these people really aren't malicious. Uh, some people who love you are still your enemies. They're not malicious, but they malfunction, right? And they, they pull you away from where you need to be. So I, can, you, can you kind of unpack that for a minute? Sure. Well, first I want to say that sometimes the toxic person in the relationship is not the other person. Right. It's you. Yep. 
And so it's important when you are evaluating relationships to be as self-aware as possible. What in me is attracting this experience? Right. Because relationships are a mirror. They are a reflection of what we are putting out. So if you keep showing up to different experiences with different people, but having the same issue, it's not them, it's you. Right. <laughs> So you keep having that same lesson until you look in the mirror and say, what in me needs this conflict? And so that's when you go inward. That's when you seek counsel. That's when you go to therapy. Like, what are you trying to heal? What hole are you trying to fill? Right? What are you longing for? This is where self-awareness comes in because the greatest relationship you can have after your relationship with God is your relationship with yourself. And some, some people are seeking what they're not giving themselves. Wow. See that? Some people are seeking in others, from others, what they're not giving themselves. So if I'm not taking care of myself, if I am not, and back to the theme, the original theme of self-care, if I'm not getting rest, if I'm not hydrated, if I am not exercising, if I am not making healthier choices to eat and to eliminate as much sugar as possible, if I am not caring for myself emotionally, if I am not practicing self-love, then it is out of integrity for me to expect anybody else to show me compassion, to show me love. Conversely, if you are practicing self-care and self-love, if you are hydrating, if you are eating nutritionally sound meals, if you are exercising and doing something every day to build up yourself, your inner man, your physical man, your emotional and mental and spiritual self, I'm showing myself love, then that is the barometer. So whoever comes in my life has to match what I am giving myself or better. Like you gotta beat me loving me because I will not tolerate you giving me less than I give myself. So more than focusing on other people, how are you loving yourself? How are you detoxing your emotions, your mindset, your spirit, your finances, your relationships? What are you tolerating that no longer serves you? Okay, you make that list. Why are you tolerating that? Why do you have a need to be needed? Why do you search for significance in other places? Why are you continuing to love people and, and show love to other people? And, and it's not really love. You really have a need to be needed so that you can feel important. And when loving them is killing you, that is when it's time for you to start doing something different but it requires a level of self-awareness and personal responsibility and emotional maturity to ask and answer questions because this is the truth about most relationships, Bishop. Even when they go south, meaning they start going away from the original intent, when you first got into it, it was exactly what you wanted. And you have to examine that. What in me even allowed me to be drawn into this context or this paradigm? And what in me prevented me from stepping away from or interrupting that pattern when I had the recognition that it was no longer serving me? And I don't mean serving me in an advantageous way and in a disadvantage to other people. I mean, we know what we know. The question is, 
Why won't you look at it? Are you being delusional? Are you in denial? And your body will tell you when you are out of alignment. Your stomach will hurt. I, I, I'm repeating this because what we don't express, we suppress in our bodies. And too much suppression leads to depression. So if you're not expressing, you're suppressing it. And then you're going to be depressed. And then your body's going to be on energetic overload. And then you're going to have high blood pressure. And you're going to have diabetes. Because now you're emotionally eating. So you're eating sugar or you're eating too much salt. And your body's all out of whack. And you're drinking sodas. And you know, you're, you're having sex. And you're getting high. And you're drinking liquor. And you're, now you're doing all of these things. That's what disease is. It is the lack of ease. And the lack of ease comes from you not sitting in the truth or the reality of what's out of alignment. So really, if you listen to your body, your body will tell you, this isn't working for me. I'm trying to get your attention. I, I'm making your body is like, you have a migraine because you won't accept the truth. Wow. Here's what's interesting. I just heard that the, the reason many of us don't want to be alone with us or don't want to be alone is because we don't want to be alone with us. Mm -hmm. And so we invest ourselves, um, our toxic selves in relationships that oftentimes, to your point, um, when we have this need to be needed, we feel superior to the person that needs us. And so equals will oftentimes frighten us um, or, or, or healthy people or whole people. The idea of being with someone who's healthy or whole, whether it's platonically, romantically, any other relationship, it frightens us because if we if we have to level up, if we have to be by ourselves, first of all, to heal ourselves, and then secondly, if we have to level up, then that's a painful experience that many of us don't, don't want to endure. Um, you just said some stuff. And you don't have to endure it. Listen, let me say this. We are all adults. You don't have to change. Right. You don't have to change. You can stay as you are. Well, this is how I am. Okay. Be that way. If you like it, I love it. If you can live with it, I can look at it. But what you will not do is constantly come to me with the same problem, same question. I give you what I'm inspired to give you because you asked me. And then you keep going back doing the same thing. Right? I don't give advice. Yeah. I don't give advice. Because when people come to you for advice, they already know the answer. They just want to share the responsibility of the consequences of whatever choices they have to make. So Say you that again. have to change. Say that again. I do not give advice. I give recommendations for your consideration, contemplation, and implementation if you want to be fully responsible for the consequences. I don't give advice. Adults don't need advice. You already know the truth. If Christ is in you and the hope of glory, we're talking to mostly believers tonight. See, now we're getting down to where the rubber meets the road. Either you believe the Bible or you don't. Christ is in us the hope of glory. He has given us all sufficiency and all things unto every good work. If any man lack wisdom, scripture says, all you got to do is ask for it. We don't want to know the truth because we don't want to be responsible for the consequences of our choices. We want someone to tell us what to do. So if we don't like the consequences, we have someone to blame. <laughs> that is immature and it is silly. And it is time for us to grow up in him. 
and be mature so that you know, we can then be mobilized to go out into the earth. I think one of the greatest disservices that the church experience, the black church experience in particular, has done to us as a people is it has handicapped us and it has disabled us and taken away our power to make decisions. We want somebody to tell us what to think. We want somebody to tell us who to marry. We want somebody to tell us so that we're right and they're wrong. Like, cut it out. Right. That's not why Christ came. Christ came so that we can be mobilized into the earth to manifest his glory, yet we're so distracted by stupid stuff. Like, I can't say it any other way. It's dumb. And while what happened to you, you know, and I don't ask people what's wrong with you. I ask, I ask what happened to you? Where did your emotional development get short-circuited? That's where you need to go back to, do your work, and come forward. Maybe you need therapy. Maybe you need medication and Jesus and somebody to lay hands on you. Whatever you need, get it. So there's a, a, a thought going around. I love it. It says, what happened to you might not be your fault, but your healing is your responsibility. You can't keep saying this happened to me in my last relationship. So when I go off like that, that's why. And you can ex you can't expect people to accommodate your dysfunction. And I, and I think that's another one of the that's another one of the um, grave problems that we experience even in the church on both ends. Um, and while this is not about pastoral ministry, et cetera, oftentimes pastors have or leaders have the need to be needed. And, and, and when they accommodate dysfunction or they accommodate malfunction or they accommodate certain things, and then, and then the people don't reciprocate, the pastors or the leaders become bitter. And by the same token, when pastors or leaders don't accommodate the dysfunction, the malfunction, et cetera, uh, then there's a segment that will cry church hurt since we're talking about the church. And I think all of us need to heal. Like all of us need to heal and all of us need to understand exactly what you've said, that we have to accept the responsibility for our own dysfunction, our own, not only the, the dysfunction, but maintaining in the dysfunction, staying in the dysfunction and accepting the responsibility for our own healing. No one can heal you. Uh, the healing comes from the inside out. Um, and I just want to, I want to implore and provoke those watching to do your work, heal. There's so much more to your life. There's so much more available to us do your work. There really is no respecter of person in Christ, right? We all have the same 24 hours. We all have the same access to the throne of grace. We all have the same access to the anointing, the oil of God. We have the same access to his favor that surrounds us. We have the same access to faith. We like there, there really is no separation and so I implore you to do your work. Where do you need to do your work? And your work doesn't have to take a long time. All it requires is you to agree with God quickly so you can have peace and good come to you. What I know for sure is that some people are addicted to their story because that's how they get attention. <laughs> Say that again. Some people are addicted to their story. That's how they get attention. And I have personal experience with this. I have people in my life that I love and who I know loves me. But I had to tell certain people, I don't want to hear that story again. Stop telling people. When people ask about who you are, where you come from, don't tell that story to anybody else. As a matter of fact, let's go outside, dig a hole. I want you to just write no more on a piece of paper, throw it in the hole, and we're going to cover it up with dirt. Like, let it stay buried. Tell a different story. 
You get to create how your story ends. You might not have had uh, a lot of power or awareness how it started and the chapters that have led you to this moment. But from this moment, I am here to declare to you that you can write the rest of your story and you get to choose, you get to create how your story ends. That's not up to anyone but you. That's why you need vision. Because without a vision, you perish. So you need vision. What is your vision for your life? Who were you born to be? Not what were you born to do, who were you born to be? And when you realize who you were born to be, the doing will happen automatically because it's gonna come up out of you. It will be organic. You won't, you won't have to you know, create a persona. It'll just flow. It'll just flow out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Wow. You gotta do your work to get to that water. Nobody wants to, to drink toxic water. Wow. So are you a river? <laughs> are you a river or are you a water processing plant? A river or a water processing plant, as only Vicki Johnson could ask. <laughs> and I'm not being funny or facetious, right? I'm saying what I'm saying, but you know me, but a lot of people might not know me who are watching. I'm saying this to provoke you to really go within. Like, what am I tolerating? that I don't have to tolerate anymore. Why am I tolerating it? And what do I need to do next so I can heal, so I can begin to attract different people into my life? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Sometimes new people can't show up because there's no room for them. Wow. You're praying, you're waiting. You're like, God, when is it gonna be my time when you make room? It's too crowded. You know, people, it sounds like this. Oh, I don't need any new friends. But the friends you have are broke. No vision, no drive, no determination. You talk about the same things all the time, over and over again. If they don't want to go, you don't want to go. If they don't want to grow, you don't want to grow. But you're waiting on better is the end of a thing than is beginning. How? When nobody has wisdom, nobody has new information, nobody has access. You have to make room in your life for the more of God. You have to do that. And that requires clarity about who you are as a person. It requires confidence in God, which gives you confidence in yourself. And it requires courage. It requires courage. Give me those again. Clarity, which is self-awareness. Confidence, which is self-knowledge, right? And then courage, which is self-empowerment. Like I have to do this afraid, I'm going to do it anyway. That's what courage is because I have faith. What is faith? Yes, it's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of what we have not seen. What is the substance of your hope? It's your words. What are you saying? What are you speaking? What are you creating? Because death and life is in the power of your tongue. You have what you say. So faith is your words and your words are evidence of what you don't see yet. So what are you saying about your relationships? What are you saying about your life? What are you saying about God? Because that is your power. You have what you say. That is literal. You hate your job. So your faith is like, okay, let's help her hate her job. <laughs> right. Right. Your family gets on your nerves. Your faith is like, okay, let's help his family get on his nerves. Conversely. If you decree and declare over your life, I'm the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath the lender and not the borrower, every need that I have, God has already supplied it to overflow. Like you have what you say. That's why when you said, how are you? How are you? How was your day? Amazing. It was good even if it didn't feel good to me. It was good because it's going to work for my good. No good thing will he withhold from me if I walk up right 
before him, right? Every good and perfect gift comes from above. I had a good day. It was amazing. So now God has to exceed my declaration and my expectation because that's what he promised to do in Ephesians 3 and 20. Exceedingly abundantly above all that I can ask or think. So I'm always about high vibrational thinking. I'm always going to be up here. Wow. And so powerful relationships should elevate you, should raise you up, should elevate your thinking, should make you curious, provoke you to go want to learn more, read more books, listen to new and different people. So relationships are everything. They are everything. Your life will never be any higher than your circle of friendship. Wow. Th there's a cat. His name is Michael Denzel Smith, um, and he's a columnist. He, he's a writer, uh, freelance. But this particular uh, article he wrote, um, he wrote for the Washington Post. And the Washington Post article was... Uh, entitled Dispelling the Myth of the Absent Black Father. And he, um, and he lays out this argument that, you know, while fatherlessness in, in, the, um, in the black community uh, is an issue, that it is not as big an issue as the media um, and the government have reported. And he, he cites a paper that was written by uh, the late Senator Pat Moynihan, Moynihan uh, from New York um, that basically said that the reason that the black, that black America was not, uh, was not experiencing economic parity, social, uh, social progress and social success, et cetera, is because of the absentee black father. So he goes on, uh, Denzel Smith goes on to say in the article that there are these non-traditional models so that even if there are not black fathers in the home, there are these extended communities or extended families in the community that would dispel the myth. Here's where I'm going with that. Uh, one of the reasons that I wanted you to be on tonight uh, and last night and tomorrow and probably about 30 more nights straight <laughs> if we make it happen was because of the the role that you play in my life how you function as as my my soul sister like you know we I, I, I thank triplet all the time again for telling me about you and preparing me for meeting you and once we connected um at his uh at his um, radio anniversary, radio anniversary, mm -hmm. then everything just just took off. And uh, one of the things you've done is you've brought that that balance to me and that sense of extended family, where I have a a sister who is one a kindred spirit, two who's like minded, um, who's on the same vibration, and who's going in the same direction. So I, I went around the long way to ask you question number five. Uh, and that is why is focusing on nurturing healthy relationships between black men and black women so necessary? Yes, we need to nurture healthy uh, romantic relationships wherein, you know, where we are in, in marriages and in partnerships, et cetera. But, um, but sister and brother, you talked about mentors. You know, we don't ju we don't just need male mentors for young males. Sometimes we'll need uh, female mentors with with that maternal, not just instinct but anointing, to help bring the best out of a young man, and vice versa. Uh, not all girls need solely. Uh, female mentors. They need men to show them how women should be treated, how women should be honored, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little about that. Why is focusing on nurturing those relationships so important 
um, in the black community in particular? Because black is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> That's because my girl. black is beautiful and black is the original. Yeah. And black has been gentrified and black has been ignored and misused and misunderstood and stolen our value, our contribution, our investment, because it requires balance, even in the divine. There, there's a balance required of masculine and feminine. Like masculine and feminine is in everyone. Like in men, there is a feminine side. In women, there is a masculine side. So the balance of that then allows us to walk out the totality of our godness. Right, right. right. And without that, without that, we become skewed in our understanding and our wisdom and our magic. I'll use that word in our brilliance and our genius. You know how much blackness has been taken out of history. Like we're starting now to hear about all the things that black people created, discovered patented um, all the way back to Egyptian times, right? With hieroglyphics, you know, like it cracks me up when um, people who ethnically come from the, the diaspora, you know, look at Africans and African-Americans a certain way, yet they're darker than me. Right. Like you came from Africa too. Right. And the further away tribes of people got away from the equator, the lighter they became. So black is the original. Right. And so where there is unity, there is strength. Behold, how good and pleasant it is for us to dwell together in unity. And when we're in unity, when we are operating in singleness of heart and singleness of focus, that is where we have our greatest power. You know, growing up, we used to hear all the time, a house divided won't stand, a people divided won't stand either. Right. So if I can, if, if the enemy of ignorance can keep us looking at one another as the enemy, male and female, then we'll never realize that power and we'll never operate in our rightful place. Like as we're coming together racially, for example, now we also have to discuss the dimension of classism. Because although some people look like you and I, because they're in a different economic class, they, I have heard uh, recently, you know, a lot of people in different economic classes who look like you and I don't feel like the struggle is their struggle. Exactly. Like they're trying to get away from their blackness through class. And all it takes is one moment to remind you, you just like us. Exactly. So to answer your question, the importance of it is that when we come together, there's nurturing, there's nourishing. Every black man came from a black woman. Hello? Yeah. Right? How can you not love me? How can you not love me? Right. I am you. We are the same. So it's easy for us to love one another when we love ourselves. What is missing is the self-love. We often engage one another from a place of self-loathing and self-hate. And I cannot, it's impossible for me to give away what I don't have. So what, what has happened, which is what we are dismantling, you know, one brick at a time, is a lot of people build relationships from their wound and not from their heart space. Wow, say that again. A lot of people are attracted to one another and build relationships from their place of woundedness. 
So your trauma is what attracts you to each other because you have a shared trauma story. How powerful would it be in friendship and family relationships and romantic relationships, ultimately in marriages, if we connected from our place of power and authenticity and love, self-love, like I love me, you love you, like, you know, you're, we're movements by ourselves, but we're a force when we're together. Like that's what I'm talking about. And friendship and romance and family, we're a force when we're together. But by myself, I'm a movement. Right? That's not arrogant. That's me boasting in the Lord. That's me giving God glory for how he is being formed in me. In feminine form. So when I look at you, I see me. When I look at my sisters, I see me. When I look at my brothers, I see me. Not necessarily man, woman, you know, specific name. I'm looking for the God in you. That's what namaste means, right? The God in me honors the God in you. So it's about information. I think the more information we get, the more curious we remain, the more we will uncover that I'm a treasure, you're a treasure. And when we come together, we're priceless. That's what it's about. That's the beauty of us loving on one another, loving on our blackness. Back to what I said originally with a laugh and a smile, but I was dead serious. Black is beautiful. Wow. Our music is beautiful. Our lips are beautiful. The fro is beautiful. Our style is beautiful. Our music is beautiful. And we are, we are the original everything. Think about it. We are the original everything. We just don't know it. (laughs) And I think, I think inherently we do, but it's so buried. It's so buried under layers of distraction. We refuse to disinvest in the narrative. Right. The narrative that's been created that we are less than, the narratives that have been created that have separated us as a people, uh, the sexes, the, the socioeconomic statuses, we've literally bought into that. So now if we disinvest in that, if we do a spiritual uh, slash psycho-emotional blackout of the narrative that's been painted by, uh, by white supremacy concerning black folk, how powerful will we be? Because again, it's all about co-empowerment. You know, what, what, happened, what happened in the garden was each person that was created in the image and the likeness of God, uh, after the serpent appeared, it became an issue of no longer co-empowering one another, but abs- but actually trying to overpower the other. And that narrative has continued ever since. I'm glad you, my sister. Glad you're my brother. Listen, I love black men. And I know you do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and we love you. Thank God you. knows we love you. Thank you. I mean, I have nephews, I have brothers, I have uncles, my dad. Like when I say I love black men, I love black men. I'm not anti-white, I'm just pro-black. Right? <laughs> I love my blackness. I do. And when we begin to love our blackness then we can create a different black experience. We have to understand that we are worthy. We are worthy of the highest experience that we're able to create. You're worthy of that. You don't need permission for that. As we begin to love ourselves, self-love is self-care. Soul care is self-care. And it's not selfish. It's not selfish. I love it. 
A couple more things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you give us three to five tips on how to achieve soul wealth? Yep. Live from your overflow, not your capacity. Your capacity is for you. What you have left over is where you serve others from, where you love others from, where you give to others from. Your capacity is for you. It's for you. Number two, enjoy your joy. Enjoy your joy. Count your blessings, not your problems, right? Number three, gratitude changes everything. It does, it changes everything. You know, start identifying what's going right instead of focusing on what you want or wish would be different. Magnify what's going right. Focus on that. Number four, where there is no reciprocity, there is no honor. I say that all the time in my tribe. Where there is no reciprocity, there is no honor. There is no honor. Wow. There is no honor. So you got to examine your relationships so that you know. And lastly, I'll say get clear on why you're here. Why were you born? Who are you? Not what do you do? Who are you? Why are you here? What, what dream have you put on the shelf that you need to take off the shelf and reactivate? Why are you here? And when you identify what that dream is, then you get a vision for it. And from the vision, you get a blueprint. And from the blueprint, now you can start creating that. So you can literally live every day of your life according to the dream and not by default and not by someone else's design. You are worthy of living the life you have dreamed about. What did you wanna do as a child? That was an indication of why you were born. That's your purpose. It's connected to that. That's what soul wealth is all about. God desires that we prosper and be in health in every area of our lives, even as our soul prospers. So get healthy in your emotions so you can live a beautiful life because it's possible. It's possible. Last night, you made a statement that was so profoundly impactful. It was, it was simple, but you said peace is possible. Mm -hmm. And I felt that when you said it. It peace. is. It's it so is. It's so I don't I don't do drama. I don't like conflict. I don't. Yeah. And I and the reason is, um, Bishop, Bishop Kevin Long, brother, <laughs> because I'm really mindful of my heartbeats. I don't have heartbeats to waste. If I am giving you my time, my energy, my love, my friendship, my support. At least say thank you. I, I need to know, I want to know, I would like to know that what I brought to you from a pure place of love, that you appreciated it so that I will know those heartbeats were worth it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And peace, regardless of what's going on around me, outside of me, sometimes in my own mind, I have to come back to peace is possible. And it's my birthright. Great peace have they that love the law of God and nothing shall offend thee. So here's my question, y'all. Can you imagine living an unoffended life? Yeah. <laughs> What would your life be like if nothing offended you? TCR would be waving hand and all that kind of stuff. Because if I have one, Noah had one message they said, 
And if I were to have one message, it would be the message of being free of offense. It's nothing like it. Being free of offense. You have to get to the place where Jesus, you know, in, in John 17, he says the tempter comes, he finds nothing in me. Where early on, three years earlier, the tempter comes and is able to lead him to various places to pull on strings, to push buttons. We call it the wilderness temptation. But by the end of his ministry, he knows that he's ready now to ascend to that next place because the buttons that Satan could push back then, he couldn't push at that particular time. So much so that when his inner circle either defected or betrayed him, he was cool with it. And when you get to the place where you tear down what I call the fence called a fence, then you are in that place that you're ready to go to the next level. And I think what you've done tonight is you have given us, and last night, you've given us tools, you've given us information, you've given us inspiration, you've challenged and corrected us so that we can prepare ourselves to go to that next place. Where can I say one more thing? You can say as many things you want to. <laughs> Because this is coming to me as a formula for manifestation. I, I want to leave us on a high, right? I want to leave us with hope because hope deferred makes the heart sick. And, you know, we're protecting those heartbeats. So uh, three things. This, this is my triple A formula for you. Right. Agree with God quickly. Agree with God quickly. Agree with God quickly so you can have peace and good come to you. When you agree with God, it's going to bring you into alignment. So you won't be out of bounds. So like these are the measurements, if you will, the barometers for your peace. Agree with God quickly, which brings you into alignment. And then as you agree with God, and you do this every day, like you, these three things, you do it, repeat. You do it every day, repeat. Agree with God quickly so you can have peace and good come to you. So agree with God quickly, which brings you into alignment. And number three, you begin to attract what other people are pursuing. Wow. It just comes to you. My Instagram post yesterday was when you're in the will of God, what you've been looking for will look for you. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All things are added to you. Can you please, as I did on my notes to you, <laughs> number seven, give a shameless. Okay plug for Dr. Vicki Johnson and all that you have going on. I would love to, ladies, because that's my primary audience. If you would join my mailing list via my website, it's vickijohnson.com, V-I-K-K-I, vickijohnson.com. I do a monthly e-blast to my mailing list. I also am on all social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at all things Vicky, all things V I K K I, and please go and subscribe to my YouTube channel, All Things Vicky Johnson. And via my website, you can get my latest book, which is Soul Wealth: Finding Vision, Compassion, Authenticity, Abundance, and Legacy in the Midst of Chaos. I have another really great bestseller called Vickyisms. And my best-selling book to date until Soul Wealth surpasses it is a book entitled Addicted to Counterfeit Love. And that book is all about relationships. All three of those books are available on my website. I have amazing self-care products, soy candles, scented shea butter, t-shirts. Like I'm living the life that I am testifying about. So no matter where you see me, I am the same. My life 
My intention is to be congruent. So whether you see me on Zoom, you meet me on the street, you hear me in the pulpit, you see me in the entertainment industry on my job, my desire has always been to be God's reflection and expression in the earth and for that to be congruent and consistent. That is the goal, that we be the same everywhere. So whatever is connected to me, whatever I am inviting you to, whatever I am offering you to by God's grace and favor and to his glory, like is going to bless your soul. I am soul well, right? I am uh, committed to doing what I was born to do to make your life better. So thanks for the opportunity, Bishop, uh, to share soul well, to share what I am doing through vickijohnson.com. Please connect with me again. I try to give equal time to all of those platforms. I'm also on LinkedIn at Dr. Vicki Johnson and just grateful uh, for this opportunity and to be called for such a time as this to share this time and space with each of you and with you, my friend and my brother. Uh, Y'all, I'm saying B-R-E-T-H-E-R. I, I don't have a like crazy accent. I'm not saying brother, I'm saying brother because that's how we talk to one another. So thank you, Bishop for this opportunity to share with TCI Charlotte. Thank you, Thank sister. You, and cistern is not a, a Southern for sister. It's a, literally, I, I said to her that she is a cistern. It's a, literally a, a, a large, a large container for water. And she is so filled with and full of knowledge, uh, et cetera, um, wisdom that that we've been privy to tonight and uh, that will take us further in our journey. Will you do me a favor? Will you consent? I'm putting you on the spot. There are 96 folk who are 107 of our own. So I'm putting you on the spot. Will you uh, come back and hang out with us? Yeah, you know I will. And after COVID-19, you got to come sit with us for a spell. I'm there. Would love to. I'm like this is our this is our reality for a while. Right. Right. So we got to dig in and whatever that takes for us to create community and to continue nurturing the communities that we're in. I am committed to that. Like community is is in my blood is actually one of the things that led me to so well. So I'm all about community and would love to do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank everyone for coming on tonight. Most certainly there are ways to give and they've already put those ways up to give. Uh, I've seen so many people saying, thank you, Dr. Dr. Vicky, thank you, Dr. Johnson. And uh, we wanna collectively from TCI say thank you. Uh, You're welcome. You know how much we appreciate you and how much we love you. Uh, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for all things in Christ Jesus. This time has been priceless. Its value, God, is far reaching. We don't even know the impact the full impact of what's happened tonight through the ministry of Dr. Vicki Johnson. Thank you for the seeds that have been sown. God, we declare our hearts to be good soil, that the seed of the word it takes root and it grows up into a strong and tall tree that will bear fruit of righteousness. God, let those fruit uh, that we bear, let that fruit that we bear be to Dr. Vicki's account. We pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would watch over your word that you've spoken to her to perform it. Yes, Lord. You would perfect those things that concern her, that there would be nothing missing, nothing lacking in her life. We thank you, God, for sustaining her now uh, in this season wherein she finds herself. But we thank you, God, for open doors thank to you. do greater ministry. You said to John on the Isle of Patmos, Behold, I have set an open door before you come up hither. And so we thank you, God, that the door that you've opened for her is a door of elevation. We thank you, God, that her voice will be heard even and in a louder and more profound uh, way throughout this nation and throughout the world. We thank you now, God, that even as there is a cry, a cry for wisdom and knowledge, a cry, God, for instruction and direction, that it will be the voice of Dr. Vicki Johnson that you will use to unravel the mysteries of life and that you will use, God, to show forth your kingdom and how your kingdom operates and works. 
Bless her lovely daughter. God, we pray now, God, that you would just increase her in every way. Anoint her in everything that she does even the more. Yes, and God, we thank you now. We thank you for soul wealth. We thank you for its success. We thank you for its progress. We thank you for its progression. And we thank you, Father, that the have has not been told. Now we bind every spirit that would try to bind Dr. Vicki. We come against every foul spirit that would try to come against her progress, her development, her advancement, and her success. We plead the blood of Jesus against every enemy. We cover Dr. Vicki and all of her endeavors with that same blood. And we declare that no weapon formed against her shall prosper. Thank and every tongue that rises against her in judgment, she shall condemn, for it is her heritage and her righteousness is of you, Father. And Father, we thank you today, God, for all who are listening. Whatever needs are represented, God, whatever things that need to be fixed, whatever ways that need to be made, whatever situations need to be worked out, God, we declare that we collectively cast all of our cares on you, for you care for us. Yes, and God. we trust in you with all of our heart. And we don't lean to our own understanding, but in all of our ways, we acknowledge you, Father, and you promise you would direct our path. And now we loose your hand, commanding your hands concerning your work. Have your way moved by your power. Prove yourself to be God, even the God of Ephesians 3 and 20, the God who will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think, according to the power that's at work in us. It is in the name of Jesus we pray, and we boldly declare now, the devil is defeated. God, you are exalted. And Jesus, you are Lord, and all who agree with the prayer of the man of God said, hallelujah, amen, and thank you, Jesus. Well, have a good night. He said he gives his beloved sweet sleep again, sis. Thank you. I love you. And Welcome. I love you, too. We'll be talking real, real soon. All right. Good night. Peace, everyone. Peace.